внимание, говорит Москва. Передаем важное правительственное сообщение. Attention, says Moscow. Today at 4 a.m., without any declaration of war, the German armed forces attacked the borders of the Soviet Union. The great patriotic war of the Soviet people against the Nazi invaders began. Советского народа против немецко-фашистских захватчиков. Наше дело правое. Враг будет разбит. Победа будет за нами. War always starts all of a sudden, although for historians, it seems inevitable after decades. The treacherous attack of the Nazi invaders, the defense of the Brest fortress, the battle of Stalingrad, the battle of Kurtz, almost every Kazakh family has their own story. The Great Patriotic War did not pass without a trace for Kazakhstan. 1.2 million people went to the front and half of them did not return. To this day, Kazakhstan recalls the Great Patriotic War. Twelve rifles, four cavalry divisions, seven rifle brigades and about 50 separate regiments and battalions consisted entirely of our fellow citizens. Moreover, representatives of Kazakhstan often fought in the most dangerous areas of the front. The family of historian Oljas Berkimbaev also has in-depth knowledge about impact of the war. Jumasil Berkimbaev, his grandfather, commanded a troop. His sibling went missing. Everything for the front, everything for the victory. Those who stayed at home worked under this motto. Mostly, they were women and children. <laughs> For example, for the needs of the front, Kazakhstan sent 150,000 horses, one and a half thousand wagon loads with clothes and food. In total, Kazakhstan people raised 4.7 billion rubles. In addition, nine out of ten bullets that were on the account of the Soviet troops were cast on our land. 220 factories were evacuated to Kazakhstan. Specialized hospitals were deployed here, where they restored the health of wounded soldiers. Raisa Safonicheva was then 17. Over the years of the war, she donated 8 litres of blood. Here every two, two and a half months, they called us. They sent a notice paper to work and we went there, donated blood and continued working. But she did not work for a long time on the home front. Soon she received a notice paper, 12 days at the transit point, two and a half months of accelerated courses. The young girl got on the second Ukrainian front, with which she reached Budapest. We did all kinds of postal services. We repaired the phones. Everything happened. We were afraid of the snipers. Sometimes a sniper shoot at us. Oleg Ivanovich is also one of those who are ranked among the generation of winners. Now he is 92. The last few years he lives in the capital's house of veterans. He collects archives and meets with school children. You can always find him in the local museum once it was opened at the initiative of the veteran. This is our museum. Here we collected everything, everything that could be. Here are the certificates of honor, plus, and here is my spoon. Even when I was on the ship, it even says here, Rubai Danilopni. In the Navy language, Rubai means eat. Well, you don't eat much, otherwise you will burst. This was a joke, of course. Oleg Ivanovich recalls that he was only 13 when the war broke out. They were returning from fishing. It was a usual Sunday. What could go wrong? 
We were fishing. We arrived in the evening. Silence. It was very calm, but the boys were running, making noise. I asked one boy, what happened? And the war with the Germans had begun. Well then, as they say, I left school. I was 13 years old and I entered a vocational school. It was then that the childhood of Oleg Ivanovich ended. He studied six classes, another year in a vocational school. When the Nazis began to approach his hometown, the students were evacuated. They walked on foot through the Caucasus Mountains, along the highway, which was bombed both day and night. All retreating military units moved along it. They reached Samarkand. From there, the young troops were sent to the Urals. But Linik could not get there. He was down with pneumonia along the way. He went to the same hospital where young fighters recovered from wounds. Many, never recovering, were dying. And then the Krasnodar teenager decided to take revenge. By any means, he broke through to the front. After discharge, he trained for two years and ended up in the Spare Rifle Regiment. There, for the first time, he was given military weapons and began to learn the basics of intelligence, how to walk in azimuth and undermine warehouses. It was a difficult war. Very difficult. You see, the Germans were better armed than us. They conquered all of Europe, took away all the weapons, their soldiers walked on foot. They were all mechanized. And we walk on foot because we were not even ready for war. There was one rifle for three. Two of them run, one carrying a rifle. He fell, the other grabbed the rifle, then the next person fell. Someone else grabbed the weapon. We were not armed because we did not want war. We did not need war. We had to build our own state because it was about 16 years after the end of the civil war and we were not ready for this. The combat pages of the biography of the war veteran ended when he was wounded in the head in one of the battles in Ukraine. It was there that they found out the real age of the young fighter and sent him home. The situation at the front was heating up. In November, the 41st German troops moved to a decisive stage, an attack on Moscow. They were located about 80 kilometers from the capital. In October, Kaluga, Mojais and Borovs near Moscow were taken. The 51st German division was to break the flanks of Soviet defense and surround the city. Near Volokolamsk, another tank division went on the offensive. But on their way, there was the Dubosekova Junction, which was defended by fighters of the 316th Rifle Division, formed in Alma-Ata. Its commander was General Panfilov. It was a real international division. Representatives of 36 nationalities and peoples fought in our division. And at the most critical moments of the Battle of Moscow, this division was a laboratory of internationalism. We Panfilov's army, and we are proud that we are Panfilov's army. We fought under the command of this modest, quiet, smart, wonderful Russian general Ivan Panfilov. На флангах, то на правом, то на левом своих полков выравнивает строй. Нет, никогда гвардейцы не забудут его дела и облик волевой. Он с нами, генерал Панфилов, всюду. Вот и теперь ведет нас жаркий бой. The battle near Dubosekova will later be included in all history textbooks. For four hours, the Panfilov's army, under heavy fire from artillery and air bombings, restrained the enemy's tanks and foot troops. They repelled several enemy attacks and destroyed 18 out of 50 tanks. But most of the unit's soldiers died. All of them were posthumously awarded the title of heroes of the Soviet Union. Москва. Последний час. 
провал немецкого плана окружения и взятия Москвы, поражение немецких войск на подступах Москвы. Brest, Leningrad, Stalingrad, the Battle of Kirks. The entire chronology of events was restored at the National Military Patriotic Center of the Armed Forces. Each Wednesday, visitors are given a theatrical tour by two big enthusiasts, Maidan Kusainov and Vitaly Fedorov. The theatrical tour was carried out by me and my deputy, Commander Fyodorov. We performed it for the first time. We thought it was the first time in the CIS, but it turned out that this was being done for the first time in Europe and in the world as well. It turned out that no one was doing it. For an entire hour, no one dressed up for all the periods of the war. We need to show everything in detail in order to show the fighting scenes with bayonets, grenades and the uniforms. It is important to show all the battles, commanders and units. It impresses everyone when we are dressed in the uniforms of the corresponding battles. It is easily remembered, especially for school children. Their eyes are shining, they remember, they absorb it all. Each period of the war has its own attributes. They specially purchase a form and the necessary props. Most of what is on display is from their own archive. For more than 30 years, Maidan Kusainov has led the Memorial Zone Student Search Squad. One of his main tasks is the search and arrangement of the lost mass graves of the soldiers who fought for Leningrad. The first map was drawn to him by his father, a direct participant in those events. When I went according to the map scheme of my father, which the frontline soldiers drew, there were a lot of dead traces of the war. They are terrible, but not a single monument. Well, since then, we have begun. We are the first researchers. There were no such movements yet. In 1979, 1980, 1989, we installed the first monument, established the first names, set the first monument for the soldiers to Polyakov Maxim Sergeyevich. The movement grew. Search expeditions became an annual event. A lot of time was spent studying the archives. Around 80% of the time is spent on archival search. About 20% of the time, even less, is spent on a field search. Moreover, those who does not work in the archive and does not know the situation, does not have a combat card, he is considered to work blindly. He does not know the situation. He does not know where the front line is. This kind of person does more harm than work itself. He would destroy mass graves or regimental cemeteries. This is what we call a wild search. There is a professional researcher. For professional research, 80% of the time they spend on archival search, while 20% on field search. We work very efficiently. We establish the names. To date, the names and fate of the front lines of 3,224 fighters and commanders were established. It was the study of archives that once allowed historian Bolat Asanov to restore historical justice. The feat of Kazakhstan's Rahim Jan Koshkarbaev was unrecognized for a long time. Together with his comrade in arms, Grigory Bolatov, they hoisted the banner of victory over the Reichstag in April 1945. They were awarded the rank of heroes of the Soviet Union, but they never received their orders. Instead, the names of other fighters, Yegorov and Kantaria, were written instead. A lot of unfair things happened precisely in connection with the assault. In fact, on April 30th, 1945, Zhukov reported to Stalin somewhere around 2.30 that the rich star is taken. Victory for us. But after his report to the Supreme Commander, he was told that the artillery firing is very tense in the Reich Stark area. He asked what kind of shooting is there. He was told that the Reich Stark has not yet been taken. How is it not yet taken? I have already made the report and ordered to form scouting groups so that at least one flag will be placed on the first or second floor. Then, they quickly create nine scouting groups. Each group has three units. These were the best of the best scouts. One of them was Koshkarbaev, Lieutenant, Grigory Bolatov, Corporal, and Pereverzev, three of them. According to Maidan Kusainov, all nine groups jumped to the Royal Square. At that time, the Germans hit out of 15 machine guns. All of them were killed. The Germans did not see them. Smoke and dust rose. They rolled over to the next tunnel. They were about five to six meters. And for seven hours, they crawled those 300 meters from tunnel to tunnel. Every second, they could be killed. They were just beginner experienced scouts. 
They knew the moment when they can make a jerk and roll. They didn't get up. They just rolled over. It was impossible to crawl. They could only roll every six meters without leaning out because when crawling, an elbow could be seen. Therefore, it was necessary to snuggle closer to the ground. And now, they are already at the reach start behind the columns. The so-called dead zone, inaccessible to machine guns. And then the Germans began to throw grenades. The German grenade explodes in 4 seconds, and they know about this. The grenade fell. They managed to stand behind the ledge. The second grenade was thrown, and they have time to jump into the tunnel. The Germans threw 5 grenades. They think that there is no one there, so they stopped throwing. The heroes waited and went to the column. Or rather, Koshkarbaev with his back to the column, put his palms up, and Bolatov put his palms on his palms and shoulders and fixed the flag on the flagpole of the column. And at that time, the people took it off to the streets. Cheers swept. Everyone who saw it was 300 meters away, not so far. Hooray, thunder! The heroes lifted the flag. Fearless and impenetrable at the front, Rahim Jan Koshkarbai was very modest in his personal life. His daughter Alia found out about the feat of her father at school. It was a new discovery for her. When he was invited to our class for the first time, it was so strange to me that it was the first time I heard a story like this because at home he didn't say anything. Alia was even more surprised to learn that her father did his heroic deed at the age of 19. He was first called to the infantry school, from the walls of which he came out as a junior lieutenant. Well, I think that generation of people, our parents, they are generally unique. Probably this war would not have been won if they had not possessed such a character, such as a will to win. Well, even to say it was a difficult childhood is to say nothing. He did not have a mother when he was five years old, and his father was repressed when he was also a child. And he went into an orphanage, and this upbringing in the orphanage, it probably tempered this character. Well, plus his own temperament, natural temperament. The feat of Koshkarbaev was officially recognized only in 2016, almost 30 years after his death. Bolat Asanov wrote a letter to the Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces of Russia, and soon he received an answer. The fact was recognized at the Institute of Military History of the Ministry of Defense. In total, 500 Kazakhstan representatives were awarded the high rank of Hero of the Soviet Union. More than 100 were awarded the Order of Glory of Third Degrees. We are proud of this. Kazakhstan should be proud, all Kazakhstan people. We show it, we talk about it. Few people talk about this, but now, more and more school children will know about it. On the occasion of the 75th anniversary of victory in the global world, a new campaign was launched. Its organizers intend to create a photo archive of the Great Patriotic War, where using face recognition technology, relatives of those who participated in the war can be found in all photographs. They can be downloaded by all internet users anywhere in the world. The rare frames are already uploaded on the network. The order of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief of the Red Army and Navy on May 8, 1945 in Berlin and representatives of the German High Command signed an act on the unconditional surrender of the German armed forces. The Great Patriotic War, waged by the Soviet people against the Nazi invaders, ended victoriously. Germany is completely defeated. Comrade Red Army men, Red Navy, sergeants, foremen, Army and Navy officers, generals, admirers and marshals, I congratulate you on the victorious end of the Great Patriotic War. <laughs> Краснофлотцы, сержанты, старшины, офицеры армии флота, генералы, адмиралы и маршалы, поздравляю вас с победоносным завершением Великой Отечественной войны!